uh, Jason Bukla, uh, senior, uh, uh, former Panthers director of amateur scouting and sports and hockey analyst. What's up, brother? How are we doing? Good morning. Doing fantastic. I agree with you about the legacy series here. I think that it's, uh, it's going to be on both sides of the ledger though, isn't mm-hmm. it? Because, uh, Boston coming off that uh, season they had last year and then bowing out and then you see the exits, uh, you know, the, the Bergerons and, mm-hmm. You know, the Krejci's leaving town, or probably not, not leaving town, you know, uh, retiring, and then these other guys picking up the torch. This is going to be interesting. Yeah, I, I can't wait for it. I think it's really one of the more compelling series when you look across the entire landscape of the Stanley Cup playoffs. But the thing is, for Matthews and Marner and Nylander, what, what feels so different to me, and even Morgan Riley, I'll lump him into this, is that these guys are all in the what is supposed to be now the heart of their primes. You know, like this is your what when you're an athlete, it's basically right between your 26 and 28 seasons. Austin Matthews, 26 years old now. So it's one thing to have these heartbreaking playoff losses when you're in your early 20s. Um, It's one thing to have that happen and go, okay, well, it's not supposed to define you. Right. Just like all of us, when we make mistakes as kids, people go, oh, he's just a kid. He's just a kid. Like, give him a break, cut him some slack, blah, 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 blah. Now, I think the the slack cutting time for these guys, it's, it's over with Boston. It's about picking up the slack of the prior generation, but they're clearly in a transitional period. Like that's what they're going to be entering, even though they were super successful for the Toronto Maple Leafs. It's, Hey, if you are what you're supposed to be and what you've always thought you were. And the reason why you kept this band together, let's see it now because you're all in your prime. There's no more growing up. This is who you are. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, and you know, if you take a look at the roster, the way it's assembled right now too, like I, I actually believe like a year ago, JD, when we made those trade deadline acquisitions mm-hmm. and we kind of ran it out there and, and we, you know, we're kind of shoving it down everybody's throats that we're different now. You know what I mean? Like down that stretch of whatever, a month and a half leading into playoffs, we're going to be, we're going to be harder to play against come playoffs. This, this version of the Toronto Maple Leafs, I mean, it's, it's had some ebbs and flows obviously, and they're not a perfect outfit, but I would say that on balance, they are um, a more, uh, difficult team to play against Mm -hmm. Uh, you know it doesn't jump out at you but i do believe that the the group is is programmed better that way so if if i do believe that it should open up more opportunities for your skill guys to do what they do best and um, to your point this is the time of year they have to go to a different level they you know absolutely i mean john Tavares is you know, I don't know what the version of him is going to be next year. So let's lump him into like, this could be the last kind of kick at the can to be potentially the best version of whatever he has left. And then certainly these other guys, you're absolutely right. Like we're eight years into the league here. Yep. That's an eternity. Like that's a career already. Yep. So it's time. Yep. Um, okay. So Keith mentioned the other night when they lost to Tampa that, you know, he basically he shifted from coach of we got to stay focused. We got to stay locked in on these games. Hey, the goal chase is a distraction. Fans don't cheer, please. When we're watching Austin Matthews touch the puck to he was himself scouting this Bruins team in between periods. So how, what is that? What does that look like for the coaching staff right now for everybody involved? What What is it that they're looking for and how does it change in terms of what you get from a scouting and a, a coaching department from the regular season when you're facing the Bruins to what you're looking for and what you're spending your time on now? So I believe that the Boston Bruins are a pretty predictable outfit. Like they only play the game. They have to play the game a certain way to have team success. If you look at the way that the roster is assembled, I mean, after Pasternak, like the drop off to get to Marshall in the two hole scoring wise, mm-hmm. it's, it's monstrous. Like, you know, they're, you know, Pasternak obviously is the guy you're going to have to um, to key on, key in on. But you know, don't lose focus of of the entire group because here's the thing: I believe that if we just get pigeonholed into worrying about Pasternak, for example, we're going to take away from what we can do well, and that is hopefully run a little bit of a track meet with some grit out of the Bertuzzi's and the Domies. The thing with the Boston Bruins is like when you get into the Coils and the Zaccas and the McAvoys and even further on down, like the Fredericks, these types of guys, mm-hmm. they really wear on you, JD, like physically. And if, if you look at the top, like the, the core, if you want to lump Riley in there and, and McAvoy in there for, for Boston, so you run it down like Pasternak, Marshawn, Coyle, Zaka, McAvoy, that kind of thing, you know, that group has over 200 more hits than the Toronto Maple Leafs top five. So what's that say? They got to wear you down. You know what I mean? For success, for team success, they got to lean on you. They got to wear you down. 
Um, the more that we can have, uh, if I can get 10 or 15% more pushback out of my core and then mm. complement it with these other guys, Bertuzzi, Domi, et cetera, to wear down Boston, um, I like our odds that way. So, um, you know, there's a couple of things in here. You know, the, the penalty kill in Boston has been exceptional since March. I mean, it's been really good. Top five in the league. I think it's around 86% where the Leafs have been sputtering on the power play like 12 percent. so it's going to come down to special teams for sure and then the the obviously the outlier here and, and it's not really an outlier it's going to be it's going to become very obvious very quickly it's going to be the goaltending mm-hmm. for sure i mean there's no doubt about it like i'm starting swayman if i'm boston he's three and all against the leaves i don't know his goals against like 1.3 save percent and something something ridiculous like that and uh we need saves in toronto so that's going to be the uh that could be the good or the bad yeah. So my only thing with the the pushback stuff is I agree with you that you always were searching for a little bit more of it from the core players, right? Um, but to me, it's going to be them more not fading away from the tough areas because Boston, yep. the thing that they do so well is take away the middle of the ice, right? That's, that's what they're going to try to do to Toronto this entire series. No middle of the ice. And then, yeah, like you said, lean on them physically, physical, 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 and hope that those players will, because frankly, those core guys have in the Stanley Cup playoffs in the past. Um, But what I found in the Boston matchups in the regular season was a lot of people were really excited about how, you know, the Domi's and Bertuzzi and a lot of these guys were getting mixed up and getting into dust ups with Boston's players. And I went, okay, that's, that is nice. I do love seeing them come together as a team and I'm not criticizing them certainly, but it did feel at times as though they were playing into Boston's hand. Like Boston is winning these games, but Toronto was going, no, but we're still tough enough to hang with you. And I, I wonder what you think about that balance in terms of these guys just saying, Hey, uh, we want to be physical. We want to respond to the physicality, but we don't want to just start feeling like we're chasing the game in that way in this series. Yeah, I agree with that too. So part of Boston's uh, strategy has always been, they, they like to get inside the head of their opponent, mm-hmm. you know, the Mars shots and these guys. And they, you know, when they're wearing you down, there's, there's extra stuff after the whistles all the time. And, you know, you're going to get a lot of that. That's just the way that they're programmed and the way that they, they try and it's like the game within the game, you know, it's like uh, that, those types of scenarios, but I'm with you. Like, here's what I want to do. I want to answer the bell between the whistles. I want to play fast. I want to play hard. I don't need Domi and Bertuzzi to be over the moon physical. I don't need that out of them, but what I need them is to have a, a you know, a, be in the fight all the time. And then when it's over, mm. don't, don't get linked into something where, you know, because Domi can go that way. We've seen it. That's his MO. It's okay. I like that about him. But at the same time, we have to be dictating, you know, that type of mental side of the game. And, and that's going to be interesting to watch as well as, as the tone of the set here, you know, that Max is amped up uh, provided he's healthy enough. And I'm sure he is. Um, he's amped up more than anybody for this playoffs, you know, given, you know, the history with his dad and stuff like that, this means Mm -hmm. something different to him as well. So, um, curious to see how that part of it goes to the, uh, just the mental aspect. Cause you know, Marshawn right from the drop of the box can be trying to get inside the least cranium. Yeah. And that's it. And so to me, the toughness is not going to be whether those, one of those guys fights or, you know, no. I mean, it's always nice if Matthews puts a little lumber into somebody after a whistle and has the snarl on his face. I'd love to see Marner not just get face washed and laugh like he's getting bullied in a schoolyard. But ultimately the toughness for me is going to be if Boston is being nasty and mean and all these different things. And then all of a sudden, you know, Matthews is scoring on the doorstep or Marner is getting into traffic and creating plays. If Nylander is driving the net consistently throughout the series and you feel like Toronto is getting to the front of the net, that will be the marker to me of, Oh, you guys are tough. Like you guys are doing it different. You realize that that's where you got to score in the postseason. Yeah, I agree with that. Like you're a high danger areas, you know, the middle of the ice, as you describe it. I mean, mm-hmm. Toronto had a hard time getting, listen, a lot of teams have a hard time getting pucks between the hash marks and the offensive zone against the Boston Bruins. It's going to be especially hard at this time of year. I get it. Mm-hmm. But to your point, that's exactly where it's got to be. And that's where I feel a little bit better about it. You know, like 
especially Matthews. I, I really do mm-hmm. feel like that part of his game has evolved. You know, we obviously know what he is, you know, goal scoring wise and everything else. But if you look over his last couple of years, JD, like the little things in his game, you know, contact, face offs, blocking shots, different things like that, they have gone to another level. And I feel like that maturity is is definitely evident for me. And that's that's a big deal. That's why, you know, I opened the show talking about his quotes and the way that he just quickly shut down the like that he was open and honest about wanting seventy, but that he also uh, capitulated and admitted that the last four games of the season were not the way they wanted to play. He, that he was worried about them trying to flip the switch and that he understands that he needs to get it done in the postseason. No, I agree. I, I really, really am optimistic about Matthew's progression as a leader and as a player. And I think that he understands the stakes. I am a little bit more, you know, curious about some of the other guys, but okay, let me pivot to this. Where do you think, cause Boston is a big, heavy team takes away the middle of the ice. Great goaltending, right? Good special teams. Where, where do you see them as the most vulnerable in this series? Like where are they most vulnerable? Well, if the Leafs can get the upper edge with a little bit more interior game and, and, push the pace between like in transition especially so win that that secondary battle in the defensive zone even if you chip a puck to space and now you got Nylander you know wheeling through the neutral zone with speed let's just say okay Mm -hmm. if if you can have it and you can win those little secondary battles more often than Boston Boston when they don't have the second up front they don't have the scoring that Toronto has they don't even have like their secondary level I guess on balance you could say is is a little bit better than Toronto's because, you know, they got like a bunch of guys that are right around 37, 40 points, whatever. But, you know, the more that we on the back end can can win these little detailed battles so that we have it more often and we're tracking with it more often, I think that, you know, hopefully that's going to lead to some more power play opportunities early in the series. I will say that because you and I have been around forever to watch hockey and the first two games of a playoff series, they'll call it relatively tight. Mm-hmm. After that, it's like a free for all, right? You know what I mean? Like the more they hate each other, the less penalties seem to get called. So uh, we got to set the tone early, uh, playing our way. So it's going to be in and out with the grit. I'm good with that. Don't get suckered into the mental side of it with all the after whistle crap. Mm-hmm. But push it offensively with pace. Do what you do best and get pucks to the net. The quicker you play, the more chances you're going to have in the middle of the ice. Mm-hmm. So here's another um, Matthews positivity stat for you. Matthews versus McAvoy this, uh, in this regular season during the minutes. Um, Toronto outshot the Bruins 40 to 10, um, which is pretty significant, okay? Uh, I feel pretty good about Matthews, his line, and what they're going to be able to do. And it seems like there's at least a possibility that Boston is going to try to load up against that group. To me, this series is really going to come down to when we're talking about secondary scoring and forward groups, what happens with Nylander, what happens with Tavares, what happens with Mitch Marner. Um, Do you like the idea of Nylander staying on his own line, spreading that talent out, or do you want to load up that second group for the the most part in this series? He's running cold for me. Yeah, I know. Uh, you know, I, I need him to be the best version of himself. And if that means I'm loading up two lines because I'm getting the best version of him, we can't have him uh, as a passenger. We need for him to have impact uh, offensively play to his identity. He's done that in the past. Let's be honest. Like, you know, uh, he's, he's never going to be a stalwart defensively. And there's going to be times he, you know, you want him to bump a little bit more, but honestly, last year in playoffs, he was, he was pretty good offensively played to his identity for the most part. Right now, I don't like him, the look of him for the last three weeks, I would say at least, mm-hmm. you know, and over a 10 game segment. Anyways, it's been pretty pedestrian. So uh, if it means we got to load it up, so be it. Um, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Um, I'm nervous about it too, based on the play. I did feel a little better after talking to Versteeg where he mentioned that the milestone chase is a player and uh, the phys- or the mental toll that the regular season can take on you that maybe you do just flip the switch and we've seen him do it before, right? Like there's, there's at least something that you can look back on, but yeah, no goals in your last 11 games and only four assists and then still not finding a way to a hundred points when it looked like it was a knock it down, easy layup for him. It's not the most encouraging thing. I just, it's, it's a tough question because you're right. He has not looked good at all. And especially since being placed down on that third line, but also if you are Toronto, like, isn't that kind of what you're looking for is they've got a third line that has James Van Riemsdyk on it. Like that's where I want Nylander to start to drive play and, and create opportunities yeah. for me. They've got a third pairing 
that if they do load up their top group is going to be fairly weak and exposed. Like maybe this is the, this is the best play for him to get going and kind of prove himself as a player too. And earn that contract. Yeah, and that's where I'm, con- you know, I'm contradicting myself when I say load them up in the top two because when you when you start throwing out names like James Ram Riemsdyk in the three hole, yeah. who's he's a plotter as we all know, and yeah. that's the matchup on that side of the ice. Yeah, you know, like that. So like when he's when he's tracking up the ice uh, or he's on zone exits, you know, defense. JVR, he's he's a late offensive zone exit guy, anyways. But what I'm saying is that you got four and a half guys for speed, not five when JVR is on the ice. So like that should open up space for guys like Nylander. So you know, it, to, it, it's going to be interesting. I think that that speaks to strategy and adjustments, and that's going to be another fascinating thing. I I don't I'm interested to hear what your thought is on this. I'm interested to see how Sheldon Keith strategizes and makes adjustments in this series because I think that's going to be one of the things that has to uh, evolve even more uh, with his experience now because, you know, it's it's I don't want to say his job's on the line, uh, but let's be honest here. We need to win, right? So it, it kind of feels like that for me too. I will say it. His job is on the line. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't have yeah. to. I don't have to be. Uh, I don't have to play politics on this. I can tell you conclusively that they lose in the first round. There is no scenario. I don't even know how that would exist. Like uh, the only way that it does is if the Leafs decide to fold up and they go, "We're done." Because then he's, I guess, the head coach of the Maple Leafs in perpetuity, the final head coach of the Maple Leafs. Like he's gone if they lose yeah, in this first round. Yeah, for the first round, for sure. Yeah. For- I'm more curious if they were able to win it uh, around, and we'll, yep. we'll we'll circle back what, what what the status would be after that. But absolutely, he's got to get through this round. But he needs to make some adjustments too, like Completely you know, agree. in-game adjustments. And he's uh, he's brought on a coaching staff that uh, you know Guy Boucher, uh, you know, to strategize special teams on the on the offensive side there and. And uh, we got to be the best version of ourselves behind the bench as well. Yeah. So, well, I, I had this written down for you, and it was actually where I was going next when we were talking about this is um, I, the discrepancy between the coaching staffs and the way that these two teams are coached. Because when you look at these two teams on paper, especially, you go, all right, I get it. The goaltending is very, very much in the favor of Boston in this series, right? They have two guys that would start for Toronto. And to the, that, like their goaltending is so good that they might break the mold when it comes to goaltending as we know it by having an actual set rotation. I don't know if they'll actually follow through on that, but that is at least being discussed in Boston right now. Like um, I read yesterday that uh, Omar hasn't played. He played back. Sorry. Uh, consecutive games this season, not back to backs, consecutive games this season. Guess how many times? Zero. I bet one, one, one time. Bad. Yeah. One time. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, okay, this is the guy, Vesna, but it's okay, fine, whatever. So they might completely change the game there. I get it, I get it, I get it. But the way that they're structured, the most more that they get out of their talent, I don't think that anyone would say that Toronto has the coaching advantage in the series, even if you think that Sheldon Keefe is a, is a good quality head coach. And if you look back on the postseason's past, that has been one of Toronto's biggest uh, bugaboos. Like, yes, have their stars elevated their play enough? No. Do you go as far as your goaltending and your best players? I completely agree. But Keefe has often been too late to react. And so, yeah, I, I do think that this is also, when it comes to like a legacy series, hey, can you outcoach a team for the first time in your career? Like, that is going to be very, very, very much on the table for Sheldon Keefe. And so I guess the way I'm going to kick it back to you is, how, how great of a discrepancy do you see here between the two coaching staffs? Oh, it's, 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 there's, there's a wide gap here. I mean, uh, but, but I would say this though, like Jim Montgomery walks into, <clears throat> excuse me, Boston and they have a culture there, JD, that's, mm-hmm. that's established in that dressing room. Right. So we've been trying to establish a culture in Toronto. We still, I, I still don't believe that we were there. Like we're not there, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of on the periphery of it. We have been for a while. But, you know, when Jim Montgomery walks into the room in in Boston, there is a culture there. So you have to coach to your strengths, but you you also don't get in the way of process that's already been established in the room in terms of the way that the group um, holds themselves accountable, if you will. So I think that's always been a challenge for Sheldon Keith. Like there's been times where he's actually called out this group in the past and went in front of us as media people a day later and apologize for being too hard on them the day before, Oof. which makes me, you know, throw up in my mouth. I'm yeah. not going to deny it. So like, come on, these guys are making 10, 11 million dollars and they can't take a little bit of a whack in the rear end once in a while, get over yourself. So 
Yeah, this is uh, this is him having to take the reins now. Prove it. I'm the leader. Like you know, uh, gone are the days in Toronto. Or that remember the, the presence that a Pat Quinn would have behind the bench. You know what I mean? It was like you knew who was in charge, type of a thing. So um, to be determined. Yeah, no, but I think that's a great point, and it's also why these players need to lead by example. Go in this series. It is as much as like again, I get it. The goaltending and the special teams and the Boston's blue line and uh, yeah, the the physical nature in which they play, like the coaching, all this stuff. It's like okay. But the, the calculus that the Leafs have made from the very outset of this was that their core four guys, their core four forwards were going to be difference makers in a way that could make, that could push them to victory. And so that's all I want to see here is, okay, you can talk about the culture being set by the head coach. I don't think that that's the case anymore. I think we all understand this. The culture is going to be set by the players. And so here's their opportunity to do it. That said, the other thing that I'm very curious about with this series is how Toronto is going to align their blue line and, and the way that they're going to go with these parents. Yeah. And I wonder if you think that Edmondson and Labushkin, how crucial they're going to be in terms of counteracting Boston's size and heaviness with their forward groups in the way that they want to play um, down low. Yeah. Well, I'm curious on Edmondson. I got to be honest, uh, mm-hmm. Labushkin, I get it right shot. And you know, uh, he's, he is what he is. You know, he's, he doesn't do anything with the puck, but he's going to lean on people. So it's going to be key. He's, you know, but under duress, he's going to have to make the proper puck plays. And I'm a little bit concerned on the right side when we start discussing this. I mean, I, to, to kind of round about answer your, or give you an answer here. Like you know, if we're dressing Lilligren and we got Labushkin, um, Lilligren's got the wheels, but does he have the brain under duress under high leverage situations to make the plays we need at this time of year? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's going to be determined. Um, Edmonton has he's a he's a six maybe seven for me like we're kind of I'm a, I'm a little perplexed to be honest with you like Benoit's gone by him so I, I see him in higher leverage uh, situations uh, right now for me personally um, so you know what do you do with Brody you know in, in this mix too because Brody, when he plays, plays 22 minutes, but Brody has not been, you know, the best version of himself for, I would say, back to last year's playoffs, to be honest with you. I know he's a plus 17 this year and whatever else, but Mm -hmm. it doesn't. Edmondson and Labushkin, if they can, if they establish themselves, you're going to get heavy hard on the one side. You're going to get long and in the way on the other side. Occasionally, um, a lot of bump out of Edmondson, but, um, you know, it's just going to come to the spatial speed down low, like the small area speed stuff, like, spinning off of those guys and taking pucks to high danger areas. So their matchups, JD should be middle six matchups. They should thrive in that. They should be able to assert themselves in that. And the Leafs need them to assert themselves in that game one. I have it. Benoit McCabe, Labushkin, Riley, Edmondson, Lilligren. If it's me, you have the same. That means, that means Brody's out. Yeah, that's where I'm at right now. That's, that's, Mm -hmm. that's where I'm at. But I mean, again, talking about adjustments, I'm yeah. not married to anything right now. Oh. I'm not married to my starting goaltender. I'm not married to what I got to do on the back end. Like it's, uh, there's no, there's no, you know, supposed depth is what we have right now. We've bragged about it. Uh, mm-hmm. If if we have to, if we have to make a call to the bullpen, let's get it done. A hundred percent. No, I, I could see. <laughs> it's it's really wild to think about this, but I could see in game two different forward groups, different blue line pairings, and a different goaltender. I don't think any of that is off the table for the Leafs. I know, and that's what scares me, to yeah. be honest with you. With, when I'm talking about establishing, you know, momentum in the series and process, like yeah. there's a difference between a, uh, a call of the bullpen and a full-on panic attack. Yeah. So you got to be you got to be cognizant of your game plan. God, I hope so. Uh, hey, Jason, thanks so much for making time today, brother. Enjoy the series. Enjoy the Stanley Cup playoffs. Oh, I can't wait, pal. Enjoy yeah. the weekend. I'll talk to you again. Absolutely. Jason Bukla, uh, former Panthers director of amateur scouting and uh, hockey analyst here for Sportsnet.